Solitude. Today there should be a four-part series to the show. This, Crime and Punishment, uh, Exercise, and Fallout 76. I think I'll have my art show on a theme showcase for tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. Okay, without further ado, let me dive into the recap. This recap is provided from litcharts.com. Okay, so in the previous chapter, chapter 8, Amaranta watches Aureliano Jose shave for the first time, noting that he is now a man. Aureliano Jose has been attracted to Amaranta for some time, as a reminder that's his aunt. When he was a boy, he would crawl into bed out of fear, but he continues to sleep beside her now, no longer out of fear, but out of comfort and attraction. And Amaranta feels the same change in their dynamic. They sleep together naked, touch each other, and almost get caught kissing by Ursula. Amaranta cuts off the relationship immediately. Aurelian Jose goes to Katarina's store and makes love to a woman he imagines is Amaranta. I think this is the first time, perhaps, that Amaranta's rejection of a of someone makes sense from an objective standpoint. Because here she's rejecting a member of her family, which again makes perfect sense. Pietro Crispy, I think, would have been a better match for her, or the Colonel Hernaldo Marquez. Either one of them would have been fine, I think. But yeah, her nephew definitely not. <laughs> like, like she she made the right call on that one. Um, Amaranta cuts off the relationship. Aureliano Jose goes to Caterina's store, makes love to him. He imagines is Amaranta. The rebel forces secretly return to Macondo on the eve of an armistice, and Aureliano Jose leaves with them. After the opposition announces the end of the war, Colonel Aureliano Buendia attempts several more revolts, continuing on his expeditions. Visitacion, the Indian servant, dies after turning down a throne in her tribe for fear of insomnia. She wanted her savings sent to Colonel Aureliano Buendia, but Ursula doesn't send them, having heard a rumor that the Colonel has been killed. Six months later, though, news arrives that he's alive and trying to unite the Federalist forces of Central America. Ursula receives a letter from him in Cuba and shows it to the conservative mayor, Jose Raquel Moncada, a man who befriended Colonel Aureliano Buendia over the years, teaching him to play chess, brainstorming if there is a way to combine the best of the two parties. Under his rule, Makanda becomes peaceful, less militant place. Uh, yeah, I think uh, General Makanda is also th the best ruler. Mo uh, the best ruler Makanda has had. He, yeah, he just see, he just objectively seems like the most balanced ruler that they've had. Father Nicanor is replaced with Father Colonel, a veteran of the war. Bruno Crispi has married Impero Mascote. Don Melcor Escalona is put in charge of the newly rebuilt school. Aureliano Segundo and Jose Arcadio Segundo are among the first students. The young Remedios is given the name Remedios the Beauty. Ursula fails to grow old, growing her business and restocking her savings in the gourds buried beneath her bed. I believe it was at the end of the last chapter that Jose Arcadia Buendia died. Her spouse, making her a widow. Uh, it would be a widow, right? I think, yeah, widowers are the male counterpart, I think, if I remember correctly. Aureliano Jose deserts the Federalist troops. Uh, which, by the way, Colonel Aureliano Buendia is, as Remedios is long passed away, so he would be a widower. Aureliano Jose deserts the Federalist troops and returns home determined to marry Amaranta. He asks her how long she will wear the black bandage on her hand. She fails to bar the door to her bedroom and they continue to sleep naked together. While fighting, he had tried to kill her by having himself killed, but the plan did not work. 
Uh, not sure how that works, but okay. One evening he heard an old man tell the story of a man who had married his aunt, who was also his cousin, and whose son ended up being his own grandfather. Aureliano Jose asks if a person can marry his aunt, and the old man tells him yes, and that the war's purpose is to allow a person to marry their own mother. Two weeks later, he deserted. Amaranta tells Aureliano Jose that he needs dispensation from the Pope to marry his own aunt, and that any of their children will be born with the tail of a pig. Aureliano Jose goes to Caterino's store and makes love to a prostitute. Amaranta begins to think again of Colonel Heronelda Marquez and bars her door so that Aureliano Jose can no longer visit her in the night. Whew. You just can't take no. <laughs> A woman arrives with a child she claims is the son of Colonel Aureliano Buendia, born with his eyes open and resembling his father. They christen him Aureliano with his mother's last name. Though Ursula offers to take over his upbringing, the woman refuses. Nine more sons arrive to be baptized, the oldest over ten years old. Uh, yeah. Colonel Aureliano Buendia is also someone who just cannot quit. <laughs> he, just, he just has to keep having sons. Seems like he just can't stop. All of them have Colonel Aureliano Buendia's look of solitude. In 12 years, they baptized a total of 17 sons of Colonel Aureliano Buendia. Like, dang. That's in 12 years, by the way. So yeah, he's pretty, pretty stinking busy. Not just with fighting the war. Ursula tells General Moncada that she wishes, wishes Colonel Aureliano Buendia would return and be reunited with his sons in her house. He tells her it will happen soon enough, knowing that Colonel Aureliano Buendia is on his way to head up the bloodiest rebellion of them all. Aureliano Jose begins to behave badly, sacking Ursula's money and getting him out of town. He learns that his mother is Pilar Ternera, who becomes his accomplice in solitude. She lends her rooms to people's casual affairs, and Aureliano Jose takes naps there. She predicts his death in the cards. He goes to see a play and sees soldiers searching the audience. He tries to run, but the captain shoots him, saying he only wishes that it were Colonel Aureliano Buendia instead. Um, this would be his son. Yeah, his son with Pilar. The captain is immediately shot, and the Liberal Party believes in his game power. General Jose Raquel Moncada takes up civil and military leadership of Macondo, afraid the soldiers are too hot-headed on their own. The regime won't admit to a state of war. Colonel Aureliano Buendia seizes two states on the coast and returns to attack Macondo. General Moncada is disappointed that the rebels are fighting well, though sympathetic to his old friend's cause. He's captured trying to escape Macondo, and he and Colonel Aureliano Buendia have lunch together at Ursula's. Colonel Aureliano Buendia replaces all the conservative laws with new ones. He reverts all the land his brother had stolen back to its original owners and visits Rebecca to tell her his plans. He can barely see her, and he advises her to scale back her mourning. Rebecca, though, lives, likes living in the house alone with her memories. Courts Marshal demand the execution of all the regular mili uh, regular army officers, including Jose Raquel Moncada. Ursula begs Colonel Aureliano Buendia not to fall through, saying that the town had its most peaceful was at its most peaceful under his rule. Colonel Aureliano Buendia refuses to commute his sentence, though. He visits his old friend in his cell to say that he is not the one executing him, but rather the revolution. General Moncada tells Colonel Aureliano Buendia that, out of his hatred for the military, he has become just like them. Colonel Aureliano Buendia accepts his friend's personal effects, agreeing to deliver them to his wife. Again, and when will the revolution end? For Colonel Aureliano Buendia's sake, he should hope that this revolution will be the last. <laughs> Otherwise, he will soon be found hoist on his own petard of continu continually changing ideas and beliefs. Like, he, he may soon be the, uh, the 
radio that gets killed by the video star, right? Colonel Hernaldo Marquez was the first to perceive the emptiness of the war. In his position as civil and military leader of Macondo, he would have telegraphic conversations twice a week with Colonel Orlando Blandia. They are they are also friends. At first, those exchanges would determine the course of a flesh and blood war, the perfectly defined outlines of which told them at any moment the exact spot where it was and the prediction of its future direction. Although he never let himself be pulled into the area of confidences, not even by his closest friends, Colonel Aureliano Buendia still had at that time the familiar tone that made it possible to identify him at the other end of the wire. Many times he would prolong the talks beyond the expected limit and let them drift into comments of a domestic nature. Little by little, however, and as the war became more intense and widespread, his image was fading away into the universe of unreality. The characteristics of his speech were more and more uncertain, and they came together and combined to form words that were gradually losing all meaning. Colonel Hernaldo Marquez limited himself then to just listening, burdened by the impression that he was in telegraphic contact with a stranger from another world. I understand, Reliano. He would conclude on the key. Long live the Liberal Party. He finally lost all contact with the war. What in other times had been a real activity, an irresistible passion of his youth, became a remote point of reference for him, an emptiness. His only refuge was Amaranta's sewing room. He would visit her every afternoon. He liked to watch her hands as she curled frothy petticoat cloth in the machine that was kept in motion by Remedios the Beauty. Uh, that's his sister, and Remedios is his, um, let me check, is that his granddaughter? I don't think so. Um, that would be his, uh, his great, great niece, because I believe... Yeah, she's the daughter of his nephew. Yeah. That's like great, great niece, I guess. Okay, um. They spent many hours without speaking, content with their reciprocal company. But while Amaranth was in inwardly pleased in keeping the fire of his devotion alive, he was unaware of the secret designs of that indecipherable heart. When the news of his return reached her, Amaranta had been smothered by anxiety. When she saw him enter the house in the middle of Colonel Aurelian Buendia's noisy escort, and she saw how he had been mistreated by the rigors of exile, made old by age and oblivion, dirty with sweat and dust, smelling like a herd, ugly with his left arm in a sling, she felt faint with disillusionment. My God, she thought, this wasn't the person I was waiting for. On the following day, however, he came back to the house shaved and clean with his mustache perfumed with lavender water and without the bloody sling. He brought her a prayer book bound in mother of pearl. How strange men are, she said, because she could not think of anything else to say. They spend their lives fighting against priests and then giving prayer books as gifts. I mean, give prayer books as gifts. I guess it would make sense for her to say that considering that she's only ever pushed them away with maybe the exception of Reliana Jose who has developed a bizarre fascination with her so yeah she hasn't exactly had good relations with, with guys in general okay um And that's on, even during the most critical days of the war, he visited her every afternoon. Many times, when Remedios the Beauty was not present, it was he who turned the wheel on sewing, on the sewing machine. Yeah, and also notable to mention, the only men in her family that she has normal relationships with, her brothers, spend like an exp extended period of time like traveling the world or something. 
Like, that was the case with Colonel Aureliano Buendia when he was fighting the war, and it was also the case with, uh, Arcadio, Jose Arcadio, before he returned home. That is his name, right? Yeah, Jose Arcadio, who is now deceased. <sighs> okay. Amaranta felt upset by the perseverance, the loyalty, the submissiveness of that man who was invested with so much authority and who nevertheless took off his sidearms in the living room so that he can go into the sewing room without weapons. But for four years, he kept repeating his love, and she would always find a way to reject him without hurting him. For even though he had not succeeded in loving him, she could no longer live without him. I'm a little bit confused. I thought this was Colonel Aureliano Badia. Not Aureliano Jose. Again, all of them have the same name, so it's very confusing. Um... Yeah, I, I assume this was her brother. Maybe she, maybe it's like famili familial love, though. I think he, Gabriel means here. Remedios the beauty, who seemed indifferent to everything and who was thought to be mentally retarded, was not insensitive to so much devotion, and she intervened in Colonel Arnaldo Marquez's favor. Amaranta suddenly discovered that the girl she had raised, who was just entering adolescence, was already the most beautiful creature that had ever been seen in Macondo. She felt reborn in her heart the rancor that she had felt in other days for Rebecca. Begging God not to impel her into the extreme state of wishing her dead, she banished her from the sewing room. Yeah, Amaranta has a strange tendency also to, like, want to exterminate, uh what she considers her uh, female competition. She, she just has a very strange tendency to want to take them out. Um, yeah, and as a matter of fact, I think it's implied in the book that she kills Remedios <laughs> trying to get Rebecca, which I think was accidental in the context of this book. It doesn't seem like she meant for that to happen at all, but it just goes to show, like, how dangerous and reckless Amaranta can be. Okay. It was around that time that Colonel Hernaldo Marquez began to feel the boredom of the war. He summoned his reserves of persuasion, his broad and repressed tenderness, ready to give up for Amaranta a glory that had cost him the sacrifice of his best years. But he could not succeed in convincing her. One August afternoon, overcome by the unbearable weight of her own obstinacy, Amaranta locked herself in her bedroom to weep over her solitude unto death after giving her final answer to her tenacious suitor. Let's forget about each other forever, she told him. We're too old for this sort of thing now. <laughs> yeah, and poor Arnaldo, he's suffering the same fate that Pietro Crispi did. Who knows if he'll go to the same lengths, though. Colonel Harinaldo Marquez had a telegraphic call from Colonel Aurelio Buendia that afternoon. It was a routine conversation which was not going to bring about any break in the stagnant war. At the end, Colonel Harinaldo Marquez looked at the desolate trees, the crystal water on the almond trees, and he found himself lost in solitude. Aureliano, he said sadly on key. It's raining in Macondo. There was a long silence on the line. Suddenly, the apparatus jumped with the pitiless letters from Colonel Erlion Buendia. Don't be a jackass, Herinaldo, the signal said. It's natural for it to be rain raining in August. They had not seen each other for such a long time that Colonel Herinaldo Marquez was upset by the aggressiveness of the reaction. Exactly. He's been gone for how long now? Two months later, however, when Colonel Aureliano Buendia returned to Macondo, his upset was changed to stupefaction. Even Ursula was surprised at how much he had changed. He came with no noise, no escort, wrapped in a cloak in spite of the heart, despite the heat. 
the three mistresses whom he installed in the same house, where he spent most of his time lying in a hammock. He scarcely read the telegraphic dispatches that reported routine operations. One occasion, Colonel Hernaldo Marquez asked him for the instructions of the evacuation of a spot on the border, where there was a danger that the conflict would become an international affair. Don't bother me with trifles, he ordered him. Consult divine providence. Perhaps the most critical moment of the war. Liberal landowners who had supported the revolution in the beginning had made secret alliances with the conservative landowners in order to stop the revision of property titles. The politicians who supplied funds for the war from exile had publicly repudiated the drastic aims of Colonel Aureliano Buendia, but even that withdrawal of authorization did not seem to bother him. He had not returned to reading his poetry, which filled him more than which filled more than five volumes and lay forgotten at the bottom of his trunk. At night or at siesta time, he would call one of his women to his hammock and obtain a rudimentary satisfaction from her. Then he would sleep like a stone and was not connected by the slightest indication of worry. Only he knew at that time that his confused heart was condemned to uncertainty forever. At first, intoxicated by the glory of his return, by his remarkable victories, he had peeped into the abyss of greatness. He took pleasure in keeping by his right hand the Duke of Marlborough his great teacher in the art of war, whose attire of skins and tiger claws aroused the respect of adults and the awe of children. It was then that he decided that no human being, not even Ursula, could come closer to him than ten feet. In the center of the chalk circle that his aides would draw whenever he stopped, which only he could enter, he would decide with brief orders that no appeal of that that had no appeal the fate of the world. First time that he was in Manaur, after the shooting of General Moncada, he hastened to fulfill his victim's last wish, and the window took the glasses. The widow took the glasses, the medal, the watch, and the ring, but she would not let him in the door. "You can't come in, Colonel," she told him. "You may be in command of your war, but I'm in command of my house." Colonel Reliano Buendia did not show any sign of anger, but his spirit only calmed down when his bodyguard had sacked the widow's house and reduced it to ashes. Yeah, Reliano has definitely changed. I think the war has made him a jerk. Like he he's definitely a lot like Scarface. <laughs> Watch out for your heart. Uh Aureliano Colonel Hernaldo Marquez would say to him then, You're rotting alive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's like, he's lived long enough to see himself become the villain, in his case. About that time, he called together a second assembly of the principal rebel commanders. He found all types, idealists, ambitious people, adventurers, those with social resentments, even common criminals. There is even a former conservative functionary who had taken refuge in the revolt to escape a judgment for misappropriation of funds. Many of them did not even know why they were fighting. In the midst of that motley crowd, whose difference of values were on the verge of causing an internal explosion, one gloomy authority stood out, General Teofilo Vargas. He was a full-blooded Indian, untamed, illiterate, and endowed with quiet wiles and a messianic vocation that aroused a demented fanaticism in his men. Colonel Aureliano Buendia called the meeting with the aim of unifying the rebel command against the maneuvers of the politicians. General Teofilo Vargas came forward with his intentions. In a few hours, he shattered the coalition of better qualified commanders and took charge of the main command. He's a wild beast, worth watching, Colonel Aureliano Buendia told his officers. That man is more dangerous to us than the Minister of War. Then a very young captain, who had always been outstanding for his timidity, raised a cautious index finger. It's quite simple, Colonel, he proposed. He has to be killed. Colonel Aurelian Opendia was not alarmed by the coldness of his proposition, but the way in which, by a fraction of a second, it had anticipated his own thoughts. Don't expect me to give an order like that, he said. He did not give it, as a matter of fact, but two weeks later, Her General Teofilo Vargas was cut to bits by machetes in an ambush, and Colonel Aurelian Opendia assumed the main command. The same night that his authority was recognized by all rebel commands, he woke up in a fright, calling for a blanket. An inner coldness which shattered his bones and tortured him even in the heat of the sun would not let him sleep for several months until it became a habit. The intoxication of power began to break apart under the waves of discomfort. His 
Searching for a cure against the chill, he had the young officer who had proposed the murder of General Teofilo Vargas shot. They also say, like, absolute power corrupts absolutely. His orders were being carried out even before they were given, even before he thought of them. And they always went much beyond what he would have dared have them do. Lost in the solitude of his immense power, he began to lose direction. He was bothered by the people who cheered him in neighboring villages. He imagined that they were the same cheers they gave the enemy. Everywhere he met adolescents who looked at him with his own eyes, who spoke to him with his own voice, who greeted him with the same mistrust to which he greeted them, and who said they were his sons. He felt scattered about, multiplied, and more solitary than ever. He was convinced that his own officers were lying to him. He fought with the Duke of Marlborough. Marlborough. The best friend a person has, he would say at that time, is one who has just died. He was weary of the uncertainty, of the vicious circle of that eternal war that always found him in the same place, but always older, wearier, even more in the position of not knowing why, how, or even when. It's like he's been fighting the war so long he's just lost his mind. Like, like he's gone completely nuts. There is always someone outside of the chalk circle. Someone who needed money. Someone who had a son with whooping cough. Or someone who wanted to go off and sleep forever because he could not stand the shit taste of the war in his mouth. And who nevertheless stood at attention to inform him. Everything normal, Colonel. Normality was precisely the most fearful part of that infinite war. Nothing ever happened. Alone, abandoned by his premonitions, fleeing the chill that was to accompany him until death, he sought a last refuge in Wakondo in the warmth of his oldest memories. His indolence was so serious that when they announced the arrival of a commission from his party that was authorized to discuss the stalemate of the war, he rolled over in his hammock without, comple without completely waking up. Take them to the horrors, he said. There were six lawyers in frock coats and top hats who endured the violent November sun with stiff stoicism. Ursula put them up in her house. They spent the greater part of the day closeted in the bedroom in hermetic conferences, and at dusk they asked for an escort and some accordion players and took over Katarina's store. Leave them alone, Colonel Orlando Bundia ordered. After all, I know what they want. At the beginning of December, the long-awaited interview, which many had foreseen as an interminable argument, was resolved in less than an hour. In the hot parlor beside the specter of the pianola shrouded in a white sheet, Colonel Reliano Bandia did not sit down that time inside the chalk circle that his aides had drawn. He sat in a chair between his political advisors and wrapped in his woolen blanket. He listened in silence to the brief proposals of the emissaries. They asked first that he renounce the revision of property titles in order to get back the support of liberal landowners. They asked... Secondly, that he renounced the fight against clerical influence in order to obtain the support of the Catholic masses. They asked finally that he renounce the aim of equal rights for natural and illegitimate children in order to preserve the integrity of the home. That means, Colonel Orlando Bundia said, smiling when the reading was over, that all we're fighting for is power. There are tactical changes, one of the delegates replied. Right now, the main thing is to broaden the popular base of the war. Then we'll have another look. One of Colonel Aurelian Bundia's political advisors hastened to intervene. It's contradiction, he said. If these changes are good, it means that the conservative regime is good. If we succeed in broadening the popular base of the war with them, as you people say, it means that the regime was a broad popular base. It means, in short, that for almost 20 years we've been fighting against the sentiments of the nation. He's going to go on, but Colonel Aurelian Bundia stopped him with a signal. Don't waste your time, doctor, he said. The important thing is that from now on we'll be fighting only for power. Yes, because that makes it all, all that much better. <laughs> Still smiling, he took the documents that the delegates gave him and made ready to sign them. Since that's the way it is, he concluded, we have no objection to accepting. His men looked at one another in consternation. Excuse me, Colonel. Colonel Harold Nelson Marquez said softly, but this is a betrayal. Colonel Aureliano Buendia held the ink pen in the air and discharged the whole weight of his authority on him. Surrender your weapons, he ordered. Colonel Harinaldo Marquez stood up and put his sidearms on the table. It's kind of weird. It's like he just keeps on overthrowing the government. Report to the bar barracks, Colonel Harinaldo Buendia ordered him. Put yourself at the disposition of the Revolutionary Court. He 
Then he signed a declaration and gave the sheet of paper to the emissary, saying to them, Here are your papers, gentlemen. Maybe you can get some advantage out of them. Two days later, Hernaldo Marquez, accused of high treason, was condemned to death. Lying in his hammock, Colonel Aurelian Bandia was insensible to the pleas for clemency. On the eve of execution, disobeying the orders not to bother him, Ursula visited him in his bedroom. Encased in black, invested with a rare solemnity, she stood during the three minutes of the interview. I know that you're going to shoot her nail, though, she said calmly, and that I can't say anything to stop it. I can't do anything to stop it. But I give you one warning. As soon as I see his body, I swear to you by the bones of my father and mother, by the memory of Jose Arcadia of Buendia, I swear to you before God that I will drag you out from wherever you're hiding and kill you with my own two hands. Before leaving the room without waiting for any reply, she concluded, it's the same as if you'd been born with the tail of a pig. I should say it's about darn time, Ursula. Your son has become a homicidal maniac. Like, who knows how many, ki how many kids he's had and how many people he's killed. During that interminable night, when... Colonel Hernel Marquez thought about his dead afternoons in Amaranta's sewing room. Colonel Aurelian Buendia scratched for many hours, trying to break the hard shell of his solitude. His only happy moments since that remote afternoon when his father had taken him to see ice had taken place in his silver workshop where he passed the time putting little goldfishes together. He had had to start 32 wars and had to violate all of his pacts with death, all like a hog in the dung heap of glory, in order to discover the privileges of simplicity almost 40 years late. Like, he could have had that even without starting 32 wars. I think that's the tragedy of Colonel Aureliano Buendia, Colonel Aureliano Buendia's character. It's like he does things without rhyme, reason, or meaning. He does things only for the sake of, like, pride and glory. And even then, it's like, it, it doesn't really matter. At dawn worn out by the tormented vigil, he appeared in his cell an hour before the execution. The farce is over, old friend, he said to Colonel Aronaldo Marquez. Let's get out of here before the mosquitoes in here execute you. Colonel Aronaldo Marquez could not repress the disdain that was inspired in him by that attitude. No, Aureliano, he replied. I'd rather be dead than see you changed into a blood tyrant, a bloody tyrant. You won't see me. Colonel Aurelian Bandia said, put on your shoes and help me get this shitty war over with. When he said it, he did not know that it was easier to start a war than to end one. It took him almost a year of fierce and bloody effort to force the government to propose conditions of peace favorable to the rebels and another year to convince his own partisans of the convenience of accepting them. He went to inconceivable extremes of cruelty to put down the rebellion of his own officers, who resisted and called for victory, and he finally relied on enemy forces to make them submit. He was never a greater soldier than at that time. The certainty that he was finally fighting for his own liberation, not for abstract ideals. For slogans that politicians could twist left and right according to the circumstances filled him with an ardent enthusiasm. Colonel Hernaldo Marquez, who fought for death with as much conviction and loyalty as he had previously fought for victory, reproached him for his useless temerity. Don't worry, he would say, smiling. Dying is much more difficult than one imagines. In his case, it was true. And how many times has he avoided death? Like, who knows? The certainty that his day was assigned gave him a mysterious immunity, immortality for a fixed period that made him invulnerable to the risks of war, and the end permitted him to win a defeat that was much more difficult, much more bloody and costly than victory. In almost 20 years of war, Colonel Aureliano Buendia had been at his house many times, but the state of urgency with which he always arrived, the military retinue that accompanied him everywhere, the aura of legend that glowed about his presence, and of which even Ursula was aware, changed him into a stranger in the end. The last time that he was in Wakanda, it took a house for his three concubines. He was seen in his own house only on two or three occasions when he had time to accept an invitation to dine. Remedios the Beauty and the twins, born during the middle of the war, scarcely knew him. Amaranta could not reconcile her image of the brother who had spent his adolescence making little goldfishes with that of the mythical warrior who had placed a distance of ten feet between himself and the rest of humanity. Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't think any character has changed as much as him. Like, he's definitely changed, and not for the better. 
<laughs> when the approach of the armistice became known, they thought that he would return change back into a human being, delivered at last for the hearts of his own people, the family feelings, dormant for such a long time, reborn stronger than ever. We will finally have a man in our house again, Ursula said. And Marantz was the first to suspect that they had lost him forever. A week before the armistice, when he entered the house without an escort, preceded by two barefoot orderlies who had posited on the porch the set off in the mule and the trunk of poetry, all that was left of his former imperial baggage. She saw him by the sewing room, and she called to him. Colonel Aurelian Albondia had trouble recognizing her. To Amaranta, she said good-humoredly, happy at his return, and she showered, she showed him the hand with the black bandage. Look. Colonel Aurelian Albondia smiled at her the same way as when he had first seen her with the bandage on that remote morning when he had come back to Mokondo condemned to death. How awful, he said. The way time passes. With how he spent his life, it seems like it hasn't really passed at all. Like, he's, he's been stuck in, like, a constant state of war for, like, who knows how many years, like, 30, 40 years. He must be like uh, Eisenhower or anyone else who was, like, 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 a career soldier. It's like... Time hasn't hardly seemed to pass at all because your whole life has been spent doing the exact same thing over and over again. It's like that book, Waiting for Godot. It's like, time doesn't actually pass because nothing actually happens. It's like the uh, parabolic time chamber in Dragon Ball Z. It's like, time doesn't pass at all because nothing ever changes. Although in that case... I think time is, time does pass, it's just extended like an absurdly long amount of time. The regular army had to protect the house. He arrived amid insults, spat upon, accused of having accelerated the war in order to sell it for a better price. He was trembling with fever and cold and his armpits were studded with sores again. Six months before, when she had heard the talk about our mistress, Crystal had opened up and swept out the bridal chamber and had burned myrrh in the corners, thinking that he would come back ready to grow old, slowly among Remedios' musty dolls. But actually, during the last few years, he had paid his final dues to life, including growing old. When he passed by the silver shop, which Ursula had prepared with special diligence, he did not even notice that the keys were in the lock. He did not notice the minute, tearing destruction that time had wreaked on the house. And that, after such prolonged absence, would have looked like a disaster to any man who had kept his memories alive. He was not pained by the peeling of the whitewash on the walls, or the dirty, cottony cobwebs in the corners of the dust, on the begonias, or the veins left on the beams by the termites, or the moss on the hinges, or any of the insidious traps that Nostalgia offered him. He sat down on the porch, wrapped in his blankets, and with his boots on, as if only waiting for it to clear. And he spent the whole afternoon watching it rain on the begonias. Ursula understood, then, that they would not have him home for long. It's not the war, she thought. It can only be death. It was a supposition that was so neat, so convincing, that she identified it as a premonition. That night, at dinner, she supposed Aureliano Segundo broke his bread with his right hand and drank his soup with his left. His twin brother, the supposed Jose Arcadio Segundo, broke his bread with his left hand and drank his soup with his right. These are the sons of Santa Sofia de la Piedad. I believe they are grandchildren of Jose Arcadio. If I'm not mistaken. Great nephews of Colonel Aurelian Badia. These. Um, so precise was their coordination that they did not look like two brothers sitting opposite each other, but like a trick of mirrors spectacle that the twins had invented when they became aware that they were equal was repeated in honor of the new rival. But Colonel Aureliano Bandia did not notice it. He seemed so alien to everything that he did not even notice her medios the beauty as she passed by naked on her way to her bedroom. Ursula was the only one who dared disturb his abstraction. If we have to go away again, she said halfway through dinner, at least try to remember how we were tonight. Then Colonel Aurelian Bundia realized without surprise that Ursula was the only human being who had succeeded in penetrating his misery. For the first time in many years, he looked her in the face. Her skin was leathery, her teeth decayed, her hair faded and colorless, and her look frightened. 
He compared her with the oldest memory that he had of her, the afternoon when he had the premonition that a pot of boiling soup was going to fall off the table. He found her broken to pieces. In an instant, he discovered the scratches, the welts, the sores, the ulcers, and the scars that had been left on her by more than half a century of daily life. He saw that those damages did not even arouse a feeling of pity in him. Then he made one last effort to search in his heart for a place where his affection had rotted away, and he could not find it. On another occasion, he felt at least a confused sense of shame when he found the smell of Ursula on his own skin, and more than once he felt her thoughts interfering with his. But all of that had been wiped out by the war. Even Remedios, his wife, at that moment, was a hazy image of someone who might have been his daughter. The countless women he had known on the desert of love, and who had spread his seed all along the coast, had left no trace in his feelings. Most of them had come into his room in the dark, and he had left, and had left before dawn. And on the following day they were nothing but a touch of fatigue in his bodily memory. The only affection that prevailed against time in the war was that which he had felt for his brother Jose Arcadio, and they were both children, and it was not based on love, but on complicity. I'm sorry, he excused himself from Ursula's request, it's just that the war has done away with everything. During the following days he busied himself destroying all trace of his passage through the world. He stripped the silver shop until all that was all that were left were impersonal objects. He gave his clothes away to the orderlies, and he buried his weapons in the courtyard. With the same feeling of penance with which his father had buried the spear that had killed Prudencio Aguilar, he kept only one pistol with one bullet in it. Ursula did not intervene. The only time she dissuaded him was when he was about to destroy the daguerreotype of Remedios that was kept in the parlor lighted by an internal lamp. That picture stopped belonging to you a long time ago, she told him. A family relic. On the evening, on the eve of our mistress, when no single object that would let him be remembered was left in the house, he took the trunk of poetry to the bakery when Santa Sofia de la Piedad was making ready to light the oven. Light it with this, he told her, handing her the first roll of yellow papers. It will burn better because they're very old things. His reminder: This is the second time that Colonel Guillaume Wendia has tried destroying his poetry. The previous time was, I don't even know, super duper long time when he was like in uh, some sort of cell to Ursula. All right, I have to use bathroom and beer bag. And she didn't do it, which is why they're still there. Yeah, I can't remember what chapter that was in either. I think it was like two chapters ago or something like that. <sighs> okay. Um, Santa Sofia de la Piedad, the silent one, the condescending one, the one who never contradicted anyone. Not even her own children had the impression that it was a forbidden act. They're important papers, she said. I think these are like his love letters to Remedios. And they, I think they are uh, reflective of like the importance of the past. Yeah, they're like mementos of the past at this point, basically, of Remedios. And I think when... 
uh, Colonel Orlean and Buendia asks for them to be destroyed, it also reflects his own forgetfulness. The fact that he can't remember what happened in the past. They're important papers, she said. Nothing of the sort, the colonel said. They're things that a person writes to himself. In that case, she said, you burn them, colonel. He not only did that, but he broke up the trunk with a hatchet and threw the pieces into the fire. Hours before, Pilar Turner had come to visit him. After so many years of not seeing her, Colonel Aureliano Badia was startled at how old and fat she had become, and how much she had lost of the splendor of her laugh. But he was also startled at the depths that she had reached in her reading of the cards. Um, sh I believe he had a son with her, Aureliano Jose. I'm not mistaken, right? Yes, correct. Where even is Aureliano Jose? I actually don't know, like we haven't seen or heard from him. Like he spent most of, I think what, the previous chapter trying to get with his aunt. Yeah, we, we stopped hearing from him for some reason. I think he went off to fight in war or something like that. Yeah, and that's the last we heard from him. He went off to fight in war. Um, Watch out for your mouth, she told him, and he wondered whether the other time she had told him that during the height of his glory, it had not been a surprisingly anticipated vision of his fate. A short time later, yeah, I think he was like poisoned or something, and then he like recovered, I, I believe. A short time later, when his personal physician finished removing his sores, he asked him, without showing any particular interest, where the exact location of his heart was. The doctor listened with his stethoscope and then painted a circle on his chest with a piece of cotton dipped in iodine. The Tuesday of the armistice dawned heavily, dawned warm and rainy. Colonel Orlando Buendia appeared in the kitchen before five o'clock and had his usual black coffee without sugar. You came into the world on a day like this, Ursula told him. Everybody was amazed at your open eyes. He did not pay any attention because he was listening to the forming of the troops, the sound of the cornets the voices of command that were shattering the dawn. Even though after so many years of war they should have sounded familiar to him, this time he felt the same weakness in his knees and the same tingling in his skin that he had felt in his youth in the presence of a naked woman. He thought confusedly, finally captive in a trap of nostalgia, that perhaps if he had married her he would have been a man without war and without glory, a nameless artisan, a happy animal. Uh, married who? Again, the only other previous subject, the only other previous person in this paragraph is Ursula. So, is it talking about his mom here? Or? <laughs> it seems like it. Yeah, there, there is no other woman mentioned in the paragraph, so I, I don't know who they're referring to. That tardy shudder which had not figured in his forethought made his breakfast bitter. At seven in the morning, when Colonel Hernaldo Marquez came to fetch him in the company of a group of rebel officers, he found him more taciturn than ever, more pensive and solitary. Ursula tried to throw a new wrap over his shoulders. What will the government think, she told him. They'll figure that you surrendered because you didn't have anything left to buy a cloak with. But he would not accept it. When he was at the door, he let her put an old felt hat of Jose Arquidio Buendia's on his head. Reliano, Ursula said to him then. Promise me that if you find that it's a bad hour for you there, that you'll think of your mother. He gave her a distant smile, raising his hand with all his fingers extended. Without saying a word, he left the house and faced the shouts, insults, and blasphemy that would follow him until he left town. Ursula put the bar on the door, having decided not to take down for the rest of her life. We'll rot in here, she thought. We'll turn to ashes in this house without men, but we won't give this miserable town the pleasure of seeing us weep. She spent the whole morning looking for a memory of her son in the most hidden of corners, but she could find none. Technically, there are men in the house. Uh, wait. Um. Yeah, 
actually, it's true that Aureliano uh, and Arcadio Segundo might not be men yet. They might still be boys, I guess. <sighs> but it's, the rate they're going, they're probably going to be men soon. The ceremony took place 15 miles from a condo in the shade of a gigantic ceiba tree around which the town of Nearlandia would be founded later. The delegates from the government and the party and the commission of the rebels who were laying down their arms were served by a noisy group of novices in white habits. who looked like a flock of doves that had been frightened by the rain. Colonel Reliano Madea ride on a muddy mule. He had not shaved, more tormented by the pain of the sores than by the great failure of his dreams. For he had reached the end of all hope, beyond glory and nostalgia of glory. In accordance with his arrangement, there was no music, no fireworks, no pealing bells, no shouts of victory, or any other manifestation that might alter the moral character of the armistice. An itinerant photographer, who took the only picture of him that could have been preserved, was forced to smash his plates without developing them. The ceremony lasted only the time necessary to sign the documents. Around the rustic table placed in the center of a patched circus tent, the delegates sat were the last officers who were faithful to Colonel Aureliano Buendia. Before taking the signature, the personal delegate of the President of the Republic tried to read the act of surrender aloud. Colonel Aureliano Buendia was against it. Let's not waste time on formalities, he said, and prepared to sign the papers without reading them. One of his officers then broke the soporific silence of the tent. Colonel, he said, please do us a favor of not being the first to sign. Colonel Aureliano Buendia acceded. The documents were all around the table in the midst of a silence that was so pure that one could have deciphered the signatures from scratching the pen on paper. The first line was still blank. Colonel Aureliano Buendia prepared to fill it. Colonel, another of his officers said, there's still time for everything to come out right. Without changing his expression, Colonel Aureliano Buendia signed the first copy. He had not finished signing the last one when a rebel colonel appeared in the doorway leading a mule carrying two chests. In spite of his extreme youth, he had a dry look and a patient expression. He was the treasurer of the revolution in the Makanda region. He had made a difficult journey of six days, pulling on, along the mule who was, who was dying of hunger, in order to arrive at the armistice on time. With an exasperated parsimony, he took down the chests, opened them, and placed on the table one by one 72 gold bricks. Everyone had forgotten about the existence of that fortune. In the disorder of the past year, when the central command fell apart and the revolution degenerated into a bloody rivalry of leaders, it was impossible to determine any responsibility. The gold of the revolution, melted into blocks that were then covered with baked clay, was beyond all control. Colonel Aureliano Bandia had the 72 gold bricks included in the inventory of surrender and closed the ceremony without allowing any speeches. The filthy adolescents stood opposite him, looking into his eyes with his own calm, syrup-colored eyes. Something else? Colonel Reliano Buddy asked him. The young colonel tightened his mouth. The receipt, he said. Colonel Reliano Buendia wrote it out on his own hand. Then he had a glass of lemonade and a piece of biscuit that the novices was, were passing around and retired to a field tent, which had been prepared for him in case he was stressed. There he took off his shirt, sat on the edge of the cot, and at 3.15 in the afternoon, took out his pistol and shot himself in the iodine circle that his personal physician had painted on his chest. At that moment, in Wakondo, Ursula took the cover off the pot of milk on the stove, wondering why it was taking so long to boil, and found it was full of worms. They had killed Aureliano, she exclaimed. In actuality, Aureliano killed Aureliano. And it's about darn time. He was well past his expiration date <laughs> at that point. She looked toward the courtyard, obeying the habit of her solitude, and then she saw Jose Arcadio Buendia soaking wet and sat in the rain, much older than when he had died. They shot him in the back, Ursula said more precisely, and no one was charitable enough to close his eyes. At dusk, through her tears, she saw the swift and luminous disks that crossed the sky like an exhalation, and she thought that it was a signal of death. She was still under the chestnut tree, sobbing at her husband's knees, when they brought in Colonel Aurelian Albania, wrapped in a blanket that was stiff with dry blood, and with his eyes open in a rage. He was out of danger. 
The bullet had followed such a neat path that the doctor was able to put a cord soaked in iodine in through the chest and withdraw it from the back. That was my masterpiece, he said with satisfaction. It was the only point where a bullet could pass through without harming any vital organ. Colonel William Wendy saw himself surrounded by charitable novices who intoned desperate songs for the repose of his soul, and he was sorry that he had not shot himself in the roof of the mouth, as he had considered doing, if only to mock the prediction of Pilar Ternera. She said, uh, watch out for your mouth or something like that. And he did, too. If I still had the authority, he told the doctor, I'd have you shot out of hand. Not for having saved my life, but for having made a fool of me. The failure of his death brought back his lost prestige in a few hours. Okay, so he, he survived. He cheated death again. Oh. Same people who invented the story that he had sold the war for a room with walls made of gold bricks defined the attempt as at suicide as an act of honor and proclaimed him a martyr. Then when he rejected the order of merit awarded him by the President of the Republic, even his most bitter enemies filled the room, asking him to withdraw recognition of the armistice and to start a new war. The house was filled with gifts meant as amends. Impressed finally by the massive support of his former comrades in arms, Colonel Raleigh and Buendia did not put aside the possibility of pleasing them. On the contrary, at a certain moment he seemed so enthusiastic with the idea of a new war that Colonel Harinaldo Marquez thought he was only waiting for a pretext to proclaim it. The pretext was offered, in fact, when the President of the Republic refused to award any military pensions to former combatants, liberal or conservative, until each was examined by a special commission and the award approved by Congress. That's an outrage, done in Colonel Aurelio Medea. They'll die of old age, waiting for the mail to come. For the first time, he felt the rocker that Ursula had brought, had bought for his convalescence. Walking about the bedroom, he dictated a strong message to the President of the Republic. In that telegram, which was never made public, he denounced the first violation of the Treaty of Nearlandia, threatened to proclaim war to the death if the assignment of pensions was not resolved within two weeks. His attitude was just so, was so just that it allowed him to hope even for the support of former conservative combatants. But the only reply from the government was the reinforcement of the military guard that had been placed at the door of his house with a pretext of protecting him and the prohibition of all types of visits. Similar methods were adopted all through the country with other leaders who bore watching. It was an operation that was so timely, drastic, and effective that months after the armistice, when Colonel Raleon Bandia had recovered, his most dedicated conspirators were dead or exiled or had been assimilated forever into public administration. Colonel Raleigh Nobondia left his room in December, and it was sufficient for him to look at the fortune in order not to think about the war again. With a vitality that seemed impossible at her age, Ursula had rejuvenated the house again. Now they're going to see who I am, she said, when she saw that her son was going to live. There won't be a better, more open house in all the world than this madhouse. She had it washed and painted, changed the furniture, restored the garden, and planted new flowers, opened doors and windows so that the dazzling light of summer would penetrate even into the bedrooms. She decreed an end to the numerous superimposed periods of mourning, and she herself exchanged her rigorous old gowns for youthful clothing. Yeah, she's another character who simply will not die. And she, she's been around for like five or six generations now, and she, she's still not dead. She must be where Colonel Raleigh and Wendy gets it from. Like they, they just do not know when to die. They cannot die. Um, when she heard it, Amaranto thought of Pietro Crispy. Oops, I think I skipped ahead. She decreed an end to the numerous superimposed periods of mourning, and she herself exchanged rigorous old gowns for youthful clothing. The music of the pianola again made the house merry. When she heard it, Amarantha thought of Pietro Crispi, his evening gardenia, and a smell of lavender, and in the depths of her withered heart, a clean rancor flourished, purified by time. One afternoon, when she was trying to put the parlor in order, Ursula asked for the help of the soldiers who were guarding the house. The young commander of the guard gave them permission. Little by little, Ursula began assigning them new chores. She divided them to eat, gave them clothing and shoes, taught them how to read and write. When the government withdrew the guard, one of them continued living in the house and was in her service for many years. On New Year's Day, driven mad by rebuffs from Remedios the Beauty, the young commander of the guard was found dead under her window.
he is not named, so seems of small effect to the overall context of the story. Solitude, of course, being a consistent theme for Amaranta and Colonel Reliano Mundia, who physically distances himself from people just as Amaranta emotionally distance her, distances herself from people. I think Ursula is probably the one that's not, like she's always interacting with people, helping people, improving the household. Okay. Thanks for watching. I'll be back with Crime and Punishment, Fallout 76, and uh, Fitness and Health. Stay tuned.